then I got this offer after the Bible Rising to go and work with Harrison Ford on a film called The Dying of the Light, mm -hmm. which was an old Swedish script. Absolutely fantastic material. Harrison Ford, and I was going to kill him if he died at the end of the film. So that's my contribution to Hollywood. I get to kill Harrison Ford. Yes. <laughs> it's like pure vanity and ego. <laughs> and, you know, I go to Hollywood, you hang out, it's all glamorous, and you realize Harrison Decides, but he doesn't want to die. So what the fuck? <laughs> okay. That was a bad failure. And I was bouncing around saying, God damn it, you know, what is this thing? And of course nothing came out of it. And then the meeting between Brian and I happened and then that let to drive, which was based on a very good book, and I had a wonderful writer trying to meet him to work with on it. So it was a great experience. But I also knew that I would come back and make on the got to kiss right after. Mm -hmm. And I was casting the movie in England while mm -hmm. I was making Drive, and I cast a guy called Luke Evans to play the Julian part, and I kissed Scott Thomas, which is now KST, as the mother. And it was all great, it was all set to go, and you know, everything was very exciting, and the idea of when you know you're going to make your next movie is such a relief. Because mm -hmm. you live in this constant fear of, are you ever going to make a movie again? Because mm -hmm. it just the stars have to line up financially, cast-wise, production-wise ideas. It's like playing the worst chess in the world. Three months before we were supposed to start, between right after the premiere of Cannes Drive at Cannes, I get a call from William Morris. Uh, just so you know, Luke Evans dropped out of your movie. But what? He dropped out of the movie? But I'm supposed to start in three weeks. Yeah. Too bad, huh? He dropped out of the movie. I'm like, well, uh, why? I mean, you know, I gave him tickets for the premiere can. I mean, <laughs> I've done everything. Yeah, he's doing The Hobbit. He's doing The Hobbit? <laughs> Playing what? One of the dwarves. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. This panic attack, this fat basically means, what do you do? Because leading man is a very important, essential piece of filmmaking if you don't have your protagonist. So I was with Ryan in L.A. at our place we always go, called the 101, which was open 24 hours diner near my house in L.A. when we did drive. We always went there. And I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, those fucking actors, man, you can't trust them. They're like the worst, man. Fuck them. <laughs> and then, through the course of that apple pie, I mean, and then that. it's interesting because I, I find you, and I admire this about you, very single-minded. I think your approach to filmmaking is quite single-minded in, in a good way. So that's a compliment because you do kick <laughs> um, But the thing I like about this film is from an outsider point of view, somebody that watches Drive, which was a critical success and a commercial success. I mean, it's rare to have those two things aligned. In that level. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you probably could have done any, a, anything that you wanted. And I didn't know the story that you were always going to do this next. But I'm impressed that you still followed through with that and made this film when you probably could have made anything you wanted to do in Hollywood. Was there ever a, a, a temptation to, to do something that maybe had a bigger paycheck or, 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 or to not follow your dream and do Only God Forgives Next? Were you ever tempted at all? Of course, especially in Hollywood, because Hollywood is like the greatest call girl. She'll promise you anything you want. And you kind of feel dirty, but it's also really exciting. If you want to try it, maybe. You kind of know it's wrong. Um, your wife's at home, you're like, well, it's not good enough. But in the end, I felt, you know what? Doing what I, I'm so lucky, I'm so, to be able to do what I do. Why throw that out now at this particular moment? So whenever it came, I just said, no, you know what? I want to go make this film instead. And I was really nervous because financially I was, you know, ruined because the films I make, I make very little money on. And, you know, I was tempting because, God, can I just go make one of those films, just take the money? And then, Thank God for Gucci, because I started working for Gucci, and <laughs> suddenly I was really happy in my situation. <laughs> um, so you find other ways to supplement your survival, to make things you make that are essentially important, because when I was making Drive, it was such a risk, like 
it was everybody was just saying to me like you blew it. you know I mean this could have you know this is not going to work just so you know and so it was a in great danger of making the film because of the consequences and that's a very creative high so it's like a juice like a drug in me that's like that's when I feel creative and with the success of Drive my first instinct was to I have to now completely destroy everything of my past because I could get very comfortable. I can very quickly recycle this formula in more and more bigger versions. But I would lose my what I think art is, which is pure sense of expression. So it was a way to destroy everything of my safetyness to free fall completely again. So when people ask, so what's it going to be like on the guy? I said, well, drive was like really good cocaine. They're like, yeah. I said, well, only got the gives. It's like very, very good acid. And not the trippy one where you want to dance and drink water, but the kind of acid where you become the chair. And that was important because I needed to kind of throw everything up in the air. Well, at least you're too tall to ever be a dwarf in the Hobbit. That's one thing you don't have to, to worry about. Let, you, you mentioned when you were talking about.